last month on the discarded image. Uh, so this talk will not feature the interpretive dance that that had, and if you haven't seen it, you need to see it online. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, so there should be handouts um, at each table, um, and it kind of lines out um, what I'll get up to uh, in the course of uh, the next bit. Um, I should say, too, that I'm not a Lewis scholar uh, per se. I speak tonight primarily as a, an avid Lewis reader. I do have a PhD in Renaissance literature, which is, as you'll see, uh, part of the program of tonight is, is to contextualize the Space Trilogy. I think one of the remarkable things um, uh, but, uh, about reading the Space Trilogy is the kind of complementarity, I guess, between Lewis's scholarship um, and, his, and his fiction, uh, and that's the case that I'll make. Um, so simply put, what I want to do is uh, make some observations to contextualize the Space Trilogy and make some observations about what I think are the distinctives of his uh, three book series. Um, so I'll, I'll argue that uh, Lewis is deeply conversant with science fiction um, at a time when it's not as valued, so uh, writing when he is, um, um, I'll, I'll point out that there are you know, connections in terms of uh, characters and themes uh, to the 19th century, uh, especially late 19th century science fiction, um, uh, particularly H.G. Wells. So Lewis uh, you know, described being a big fan of Wells uh, and Jules Verne, um, uh, and you can see that. But as um, C.S. Lewis uh, scholar Tom Shippey points out, uh, Lewis appropriates um, a lot of features of 19th century science fiction in order to critique the philosophy that he sees undergirding a lot of those works. And so the way that he does that is he draws on his wealth of uh, medieval and Renaissance knowledge to do so. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of what I'll say tonight um, sort of illustrates that, I think. And so lastly, I want to argue um, that reading Lewis's science fiction can have a salutary benefit, I think, um, um, in our contemporary world. So it gives a kind of vantage point to critique kind of modernity. So that's the last thing that I'll argue. So I suppose, uh, I guess the best place to start, uh, if you're interested in getting a handle on Lewis's um, uh, convictions about science fiction, there's a collected uh, group of essays uh, called Of Other Worlds, um, and there's an essay there that was originally delivered at, as a talk to an English club at Cambridge, and I think in 1955. So not unlike this group, um, they gathered and he presented a paper, um, and it sort of lines out uh, his convictions about science fiction. And he gives a sort of taxonomy of different types. Uh, and I think that, for me, is clarifying to see what he's up to, because, you know, that hideous strength is published, you know, 10 years earlier, so it's kind of a retrospective, and he's had some time to think about what he, what he accomplished and pulled off in the course of the trilogy. Um, so in the essay, um, interestingly, he invokes two approaches to the genre that I think still um, kind of characterize scholarship on science fiction. That is, you can have a historicist approach, which is to say science fiction develops at a particular time, um, you know, the high point is the 19th century, or you can kind of have an essentialist approach, which is to say it really is about these essential characteristics. And, and in that case, it blows open history, and you can start as early as, say, Dante's Divine Comedy and say that's, you know, proto-science fiction or something like that. Um, so he does, he does both of those. Um, but at the outset, he, met, he admits to being a, a, a reader of science fiction and somebody who, who loves it, um, and he finds it kind of curious that there's been a kind of explosion of interest in the, in the genre. Uh, he says it's like, you know, uh, enjoying these vistas and these favorite walks, and all of a sudden it's crowded with strangers all of a sudden. Um, um, but I think uh, if you want to, I think, recognize deep correspondence between his work and 19th century science fiction, I think the, the, the place to start probably is H.G. Wells uh, and his work, First Men in the Moon. Uh, because Out of the Silent Planet really does kind of start with um, a kind of parody uh, approach to that work. Um, so it's deeply um, um, uh, sort of structurally similar um, uh, and, and characters uh, and themes, etc. But w one of the things that I did in sort of preparing for tonight is, is kind of tour back through H.G. Wells, which was a lot of fun. Um, 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 but I was struck by just the, the correspondences, uh, reading Wells and then, and then reading Lewis. 
Um, so, you know, things like motifs and themes, so you get the mad scientist motif shows up in 19th century fiction. We get that in Lewis's, um, for instance, his uh, Professor Weston or Professor Frost. You get the theme of evolution. Uh, you get the theme of uh, kind of technological ethics uh, and science. All of these things uh, show up and they're their speeches, I think, even that Lewis has in mind when he has Weston sort of in his megalomania sort of talk about, um, you know, the, the power of conquest and a kind of Nietzschean will to power. I think he's, he's thinking about, like, uh, Dr. Moreau, for instance, in the Isle of Dr. Moreau. Um, so, and I think uh, to drive it home, I guess, to that hideous strength, I think uh, Dr. Frost is, um, is the inheritor. Um, so I, I should begin with uh, plot spoilers um, I apologize for anything that I, I spoil, uh, but I figure if you're here, you're, you're, you're kind of amenable to hearing details from the stories. But uh, So Frost um, picks up the mantle, I think, from Weston, given that he disappears uh, or is dispatched uh, in Paralandra. So, um, uh, so there, he's borrowing from all sorts of 19th century uh, science fiction that he knew and that he loved, but I think his uh, key departure... Um, is his understanding of what science fiction is really about. So I said he offers a, a taxonomy in that essay of science fiction, or on science fiction. He says, you know, like he runs through seven different types or, or kinds that you get when you're reading science fiction. So he says, you know, the bad kinds that feature people who just want to write stories and get published, and so they pick science fiction because they get published. Uh, they're the satirical ones. They're the, uh, the technological purists, so people like Jules Verne who really love the stuff, the technology, and sort of uh, you know, have these extended explorations of um, um, the technology on display. You have the, um, I guess, the, the exploratory kind, the people who are interested in foreign vistas, um, you know, foreign planets. Uh, you have the eschatological or apocalyptic kind, so the end of days uh, science fiction. And then he focuses on a last kind, and I think this is the one that he's most interested in and the, and the one that he wants to write uh, and does write in, in, uh, in the form of the trilogy. And that is the kind that explores strange encounters um, uh, where the, the, the aim is to have moments of, as he puts it, beauty or awe or terror that the actual world does not supply. Um, so he calls this fantastical literature, which is a type that, that he prefers. Um, and another way of thinking about this is uh, people who like this kind of essentialist approach. Um, and it's on your uh, bibliography, this, this scholar, uh, Adam Roberts is his name. But he defines science fiction in terms of, uh, just like Lewis does, this encounter with the other, which is produces these moments of wonder. Um, so for him... Um, science fiction is fundamentally about alterity, if you like. So this encounter, this weird encounter with something that's foreign and strange and wondrous and uncanny. Uh, and so I think Lewis really likes that idea and he sort of seeks after that in his fiction. But the difference is he reads 19th century science fiction and sees it, um, the wondrous is an encounter with natural life or biological life, just, you know, extraterrestrial. But he, he uh, renders a version where it's actually um, about supernatural life. Uh, so the other is really about the divinely other, I think, with his rendering of angels and demons, um, uh, for instance. So uh, I think that's, that's what you get um, uh, as a distinctive of his science fiction. Um, and that's something that he's interested in, certainly not just here in the trilogy. I mean, that's something that he's interested in and in, say, uh, Till We Have Faces. So if you know that novel, um, I've included on your handout, um, I think it's the second quote, um, uh, but that's a, a, a quote that's featured in um, Till We Have Faces, and that's uh, the protagonist, Orwell, has an encounter with the god Cupid. Uh, and again, a plot spoiler. Uh, but that's the rendering uh, that we get of Cupid, and it has this... Um, it, it, it features this uncanny moment of what it's like to be in the presence of a god, and it's very disturbing uh, to Orwell. Um, but at least in the science fiction uh, uh, or space trilogy, um, so he's licensed by the genre to have these encounters with the other, uh, but his aim is to have it um, have encounters that, that feature these kind of 
supernatural uh, interactions or interactions with supernatural entities where the philosophy on display is fundamentally uh, counter to uh, the, the kind of philosophy on display that he reads in, say, Wells or uh, Olaf Stapleton's um, uh, um, uh, work and, and, and others. Um, so, okay, so what am I saying? When, I, when I'm thinking about these supernatural inter, uh, exchanges or interactions, I have a few more quotes that, that illustrate what I'm talking about. So in the, in the Space Trilogy in Paralandra, for instance, uh, we get um, um, a, a moment uh, like that with the character Lewis's interaction or description of an angel. Um, and that's, the, that, that's on page two at the top. Uh, so he gives this disorienting uh, description of what it's like to uh, be in the presence of an angel. So he says, for instance, um, uh, what one actually felt at the moment was that the column of light was vertical, but that the floor was not horizontal. The whole room seemed to have healed over as if it were on board, uh, on board ship. The impression was that this creature had reference to some horizontal, to some whole system of directions based outside the earth, and that its mere presence imposed that alien system on me and abolished the terrestrial horizon. So we get moments like that. Um, I think uh, that's what Lewis is seeking after, I think, in his space trilogy, these, these moments of engagement with these entities that are, in, that are divinely or entirely other from you know, natural life. So um, he's not just interested in heavenly entities. He's also interested in, in diabolical entities. Uh, and so to, to give an example of that, uh, we get on page two, the, the second quote is the uh, interaction with uh, the diabolical um, uh, figure that, uh, of the tempter who, who uh, tempts the lady of Paralandra uh, to disobey God. Um, and that's the, the, the second, um, second quote there. Um, and because I couldn't resist, I included another. I, I got kind of carried away with the unsettling interactions with this demonic uh, figure. Uh, and that's the, uh, the last quote on that page. Um, so he observes their interactions, uh, his tempting the woman and tries to counter. Uh, and this is when uh, he and the character have um, this confrontation. Um, and the, the entity quotes Christ back to him. Uh, and we get this description. So Ransom felt certain that the sounds it made were perfect Aramaic of the first century. The unman was not quoting, it was remembering. These were the very words spoken from the cross, treasured through all those years in the burning memory of the outcast creature which had heard, which, um, had heard them and now brought forward in hideous, hideous parody and the horror made him momentarily sick. Um, so it's uh, uh, an engagement that produces a kind of visceral reaction uh, in Ransom. Okay, so if, if, uh, if these are the kind of moments that Lewis is going after, uh, these moments of otherness where um, by proxy we have exposure to these supernatural entities, um, I, I think, so that's a, that's a, a big departure from 19th century um, science fiction. I think Lewis draws on his, his wealth of medieval and Renaissance knowledge um, to actually critique um, um, the, the sort of perception of the philosophy of uh, undergirding these works. And so his representation of the universe is, is deeply medieval. So if you like, it really is reading these stories, it really is a, a 20th century story, uh, but sort of set in uh, a kind of medieval universe. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, um, I, think, I, I think it's clarifying to, to set medieval texts and Renaissance texts side by side with it. And um, I think when you, when you first think about science fiction, I think the, the idea is that other worlds really are maybe the result of, you know, 19th century, early 19th century kind of, um, you know, speculation. But as medievalists are quick to point out, um, the notion of other worlds or many worlds is a medieval idea. Uh, and it really is a Renaissance uh, fascination and preoccupation. So they're deeply speculative about um, the idea of other worlds uh, out there. Um, so famous texts that would mention this would be things like Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy or John Donne's uh, Devotions, if you like. Um, 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 or and, and, you know, they even speculate about if there are other worlds, are they affected by Adam's uh, transgression um, uh, in, in Genesis? Um, so it's, it's, you know, fodder for 
theological speculation. I suppose the most famous, um, uh, re- uh, I guess, depiction of speculative depiction of other worlds probably would be Paradise Lost. So famously, Milton references other worlds, and that's the first quote that you have on your handout. So you get um, the first quote is uh, Satan's trip from hell to Eden on his uh, terrorist undertaking to try to destroy uh, Eden any way he can. So he travels this oblique way, which is like a uh, you know suggestion of his eventual um, um, taking the form of the serpent. But we get this glancing reference to uh, of other worlds out there. And then the second quote is um, in conversation in Book Eight. Adam talks to an angel, Raphael, uh, and Raphael sort of, you know, warns Adam about being sort of speculating about, uh, you know, these hypothetical other worlds, uh, and he says, dream not of other worlds, what creatures there live, in what state. So you get this, you know, Milton, in the way that he does, referencing this rich body of knowledge, uh, which includes uh, a a long history of thinking about other worlds out there. So um, um, I think Lewis is is, uh, in that tradition. Um, I think, along with other worlds, I think Lewis's representation of space uh, and the operation of the cosmos uh, corresponds, actually, to the medieval model. Uh, and you got some of this, uh, I, I guess, um, again, to make, I feel like I'm giving lots of promos for Bill Davis's talk, but Bill talked about this in the discarded image, um, where you have Lewis's loving, um, uh, really compelling rendering of what it was like to look at the night sky as a medieval, and the idea is that the medieval conception is not space, this, uh, this region of cold, terrifying vacuity. It's actually, uh, the term is, is the heavens. Um, and so I think what Lewis does is to suggest that the medieval conception is actually more accurate. Um, and so you get that, I, I guess, most famously in the trilogy when Ransom is kidnapped and they're moving out toward uh, Malacandra. And he sort of speculates about or, or, you know, describes what it's like to be in space. Uh, and that's uh, on page three, uh, that first quote. Uh, so if you'll indulge me, uh, let me, let me read this out loud. Um, okay. But Ransom, as time wore on, became aware of another and more spiritual cause for his progressive lightning and exaltation of heart. A nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science was falling off him. He had read of space. At the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black, cold vacuity, the utter deadness, which was supposed to separate the worlds. He had not known how this empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. Uh, uh, Yeah, sorry. Uh, Now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous libel. Uh, He could not call it dead. He felt life pouring into him from every moment. How indeed should it be otherwise, since out of this ocean... The worlds and all their life had come. Um, So a bit down. So no, space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they named it simply the heavens, the heavens which declared the glory. Uh, And then he quotes Milton, the happy climes that lie where day never shuts his eye up in the broad fields of the sky. He quoted Milton's words to himself lovingly at this time and often. So thus Lewis transforms space into the heavens And so it's constructed according to uh, the logic of the great chain of being, if you know that from your, you know, medieval history uh, lectures, uh, where the the universe is like this towering, finite, and beautifully ornate structure. And to move out from the earth is to move toward the realm of light and music and vitality and energy. Um, And I think what Lewis is up to here is trying to uh, have a reader experience that uh, first person, again, by proxy with ransom. So much so that when I teach, um, you know, the medieval perspective in our history of ideas class at Covenant, I'll occasionally include this passage to say this is what it, you know, uh, this is what it's like. Um, It's a great rendering of what it's like. And so uh, I will say, too, incidentally, ransom's uh, education Uh, I think makes him really suited to understand the operation of the universe here because he's a philologist, but he's well-versed in poetry. It's something that, you know, the the Weston condemns as ridiculous foolery, like what did you waste your time on? But it's actually poetry um, that better apprehends uh, or is closer to the truth of the universe. So I'm hesitant to speak about this in the presence of somebody who uh, is an expert on this, but the trilogy 
uh, asserts that it's poetry uh, more than any, uh, in, in some sense, more than any other discipline that helps um, Ransom and company understand truths uh, of human experience and the creation of the world. So, um, as demonstrated here by Comus, Lewis does this throughout uh, the trilogy. Um, and maybe, uh, sorry, to bring it home again to that hideous strength, there's a moment where Merlin and Ransom interact with the angels, and it's overwhelming, practically. Uh, and the description is really ter- telling. Uh, Ransom says, It was well that both men had some knowledge of poetry. The doubling, splitting, and recombining of thoughts which now went on in them would have been unendurable for one uh, whom that art had not already instructed in the counterpoint of the mind, the mastery of double and treble vision. For Ransom, whose study had been for many years in the realm of words, it was heavenly pleasure. Um, So, you know, there's nothing wrong with good science, uh, but it's actually poetry um, that's going to help you understand uh, Uh, the fabric of the universe. Okay, so um, uh, to focus on a few more, I guess, medieval features um, of the the trilogy, um, uh, I I, I suppose, well, another instance, I guess, from that hideous strength, it's it's really replete with uh, medieval and Renaissance references. I guess beginning with Jane Studdock, who's trying to finish her her dissertation on John Donne, uh, we get reference to, you know, Ben Jonson's Volponi, we get uh, reference to uh, uh, Guillaume de Lloris's uh, The Romance of the Rose. Um, so it's full of references to uh, medieval and Renaissance texts. And if you'll indulge an in academic's exuberance about the archive, um, there is a, a Lewis treasure trove for those who are interested, uh, Lewis scholars and fans. Um, famously, Lewis's um, Library, a lot of the books, of ne- nearly 3,000, you know, end up at Wheaton famously. So you can go to Wheaton to check out uh, and see some of these. But a lesser known fact is that Lewis's literary executor uh, and friend uh, and secretary, Walter Hooper, handpicked a number of texts and actually sent them to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so uh, I mention that because a lot of the books that are referenced in that hideous strength are actually there, and you can go to the special you know, collections library and call these up and look at them. And this is what a friend and I did in graduate school when we should have been studying for exams or dissertating or you know, any number of things. We would go and spend time kind of touring through Lewis's stuff, and it, it's a fascinating collection of material. They contain lots of marginalia, you know, notes from people, uh, uh, at least one unpublished essay on Lucretius. And I think one of the strongest takeaways from looking at, at his books is just how, you know, an engaged and present and active reader Lewis was. I mean, in some ways, he was a, as an extraordinary reader as he was a writer. Uh, and so he'll do things like, you know, uh, create running headers, create his own indices with topics that he's interested in. Uh, he'll correct footnotes. He'll write no, wrong. Um, uh, he'll draw maps. So he's fully, uh, you know, engaged with his, you know, uh, imagination uh, and rationality with these, uh, with these works. And so um, um, I mention this too because, you know, at the outset of that hideous strength, he, he mentions uh, Stapleton's uh, book *Last and First Men* as an inspiration. And you can, they, they have his copy of, of Stapleton, so you can see his interaction with this text. Okay, so um, thus ends my anecdote. Thanks, thank y'all for indulging that. Okay, so, so other medieval elements, I suppose, that might be helpful to, to point out in that hideous strength, I think the biggest probably would be Arthurian elements. So you read it and you, and you realize um, uh, just how much correspondence there is to the Arthurian lit tradition. Um, so, uh, you know, Lewis is borrowing from people like Chrétien de Troyes, uh, Robert de Baron, um, the Vulgate cycle, all of these things that give versions of the Arthurian tradition. And, and most famously, I guess, um, uh, Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur. So that's probably the, uh, maybe the most prominent. So uh, the way that Ransom creates this society at St. Anne's on the Hill uh, corresponds to, I think, um, the, um, the Knights of the Round Table. So it's the society uh, that's the force for good. And the ransom assumes uh, the title of uh, Pendragon or Pendragon of Logris, uh, and so that succession goes goes all the way back to to Arthur, um, and so their objective is to fight the the forces of darkness, uh, so a force for good like like Arthur. Um, other, I guess, Arthurian connections would be 
the way that Ransom is like the Fisher King, the way that he has that, that wound in his heel. Uh, that's intended to uh, correspond to the Fisher King and Cretien uh, and the way that, that um, uh, um, he has this, he's sort of preternaturally young uh, because of his experiences um, kind of harkens back to the Fisher King. Um, and also, incidentally, I guess in the Arthurian tradition, um, uh, the chronicle tradition in, uh, in Arthur stories tends to represent um, Arthur as true history. Uh, now, in the romance tradition, it's, it's more just fanciful stories, but the chronicle tradition says, no, this probably was true, going all the way back to, uh, say, um, I guess maybe uh, Gildas in the 6th century. Um, suggest that this is this actually happened. He probably was a, a Romanized Celt who sort of fought the Angles and the Saxons. And what Lewis brilliantly does, I think, in that hideous strength, is to suggest that um, this this fascination that the West has with Arthurian tales really is the in, in poetry is the apprehension of something that's true, um, and and that is that it's uh, you know Arthur's court was this moral and spiritual exemplar. Um, and I think that hideous strength kind of represents it that way. Um, so he's drawing on that tradition. And, and uh, uh, no place more famously than his rendering of Merlin. Uh, so for my money, that maybe is the most delightful uh, part, I guess, of that hideous strength uh, when Merlin shows up. Um, he's the most dramatic, I guess, element of Arthurian lit. Um, I've alluded to Tom Shippey, but he, he, he calls uh, Merlin maybe the most strikingly original feature of that hideous strength. Um, so he's uh, this presumed uh, uh, weapon for the NICE, the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, um, uh, which is a great uh, title. I think there actually is a NICE organization in England to this day. Um, in any case, uh, they presume that they're going to reanimate um, Merlin. I think we presume that too. And I think the, the most pleasant kind of rope a moment uh, if I can use that term, in that hideous strength is the moment where he shows up and actually throws in his lot with Ransom and company and kind of reveals himself to be a, a, a Christian. I think um, Lewis sort of pulls off that surprise, delightful surprise, in part because Merlin is such a, a kind of uh, ambiguous and uh, amb uh, ambivalent kind of figure. Uh, he's this kind of mediator in between character, between spiritual forces and um, um, the, the, the human society. Um, and I think what, what Lewis is thinking about probably is uh, uh, Robert de Baron has a, an old French verse, Merlin, uh, and there uh, Merlin is the result of a, a group of demons who get together and want to destroy humanity, uh, and so they coordinate the birth of this uh, creature that's half demon uh, and half human, but what happens is um, this, this, uh, uh, the, the woman who's impregnated uh, has uh, access to a priest, uh, and he gets there first and, and, and manages to uh, um, coordinate things such that Merlin is not a force for evil, and yet he retains his, his father's sort of supernatural power. And so I think you, this association with demons is what, what Lewis is kind of drawing on that get you to go, okay, well, you know, of course Merlin's going to throw his lot in with, you know, uh, Hardcastle and Frost and, you know, Wither and company, and, and we're, we're going to be terrified. Um, but uh, he turns things around, and Merlin uh, serves the good. So that, that for me, that, that mediating role um, is true about Merlin in the Arthurian tradition, and I think it's true here um, with, with Lewis's use. So he's that, that figure that's ambiguous, but he's just the sort of figure that's needed to be empowered by the angels to defeat um, the, the kind of entities um, uh, at, at nice. Um, so I think Lewis, uh, in his scholarship, tends to talk about Merlin in just this kind of way. So if you want to see uh, an example of that, I think the discarded image, again, is the place to see it. And he has this really interesting remark. He says, Merlin, only half human by blood and never shown practicing magic as an art, almost belongs to this order, that is, of fairy damsels associated with the natural world who interact with humankind like Bursalak in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So this, this kind of like he's not a morally compromised figure like, say, um, Dr. Faustus with, with Marlowe. So kind of perfect uh, because of his moral ambiguity 
uh, he's perfectly suited to Lewis's kind of narrative task, I think. Uh, so to bridge that gap between the ancient past and the present. And I've included my favorite uh, you know, characterization of, of Merlin on page three. That's uh, Dr. Uh, Dimble talking about, about Merlin and, and, um, and his association with the ancient world. And in some sense, I think Lewis is, is sort of, it's kind of like wish fulfillment in the way that he's giving you uh, first-person exposure to, uh, uh, to Merlin, um, as if you know, he wanted, you know, he too would lo- loves this um, uh, engagement with a figure who's you know, moving and talking and um, uh, representing a, a whole era. Um, I will say that not only does Lewis borrow characters like Merlin um, uh, and uh, the society of, uh, of Arthur, he also um, puts them to narrative uses um, that you find in the Arthurian tradition. Um, so, for example, uh, the way that he represents this special relationship between England and Christianity, uh, that's deeply in the um, Arthurian tradition. Uh, so that the, I mean, Lewis has the, the fate of the world, the fate of uh, humanity take place or play out in England. Um, so it, it has a, and, and society at, at St. Anne's has a kind of English quality. Um, and conversely, the, the forces of Nice actually have a kind of presence of uh, foreigners in contrast. So you got Philostrato, um, you have, um, I guess, um, this would count, I guess, Alcazan, who, whose head is reanimated. Um, uh, uh, and others. Now, certainly, Lewis characterizes um, them in a in a kind of um, uh, unnatural way too. I think his primary interest is to show how unnatural they are, uh, and you can see that in the names. So you have Hardcastle, you have Frost, you have Wither, um, uh, 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 and then conversely, at St. Anne's, you have uh, natural names like Camilla, I guess, and Ivy and Grace, um, uh, etc. But I think the, the foreign presence uh, is, is sort of in that Arthurian tradition to say we need to, um, the, uh, the, the English tradition of, of inher- inheritors of Arthur are, are on the forces of good there. Um, and then I think the, the, the spiritual quest that you find in Arthurian lit um, um, are on display here too. Um, so a lot of times in, in these um, stories of Arthur, you have knights going off on, on quests, and often they're given sort of moral choices that have spiritual consequences. Um, and this, you, you can see this in the, the Vulgate Grail quest, certainly, um, uh, where the knights are sort of uh, off on miscellaneous adventures, and, this, and the story picks up and follows each of them. Um, but I think we get that, or a version of that, with Mark Studdock. So you know in that hideous strength, the way that it flashes back and forth between Jane and Mark, I think it's giving a version of that. Um, but especially Mark uh, in the way that he's tempted um, over the course of the novel to get deeper into uh, the organization and to commit more of himself uh, um, in the community at Nice and be more and more morally culpable with every sort of conscious decision that he makes. Um, And there's a sense in which we can see that moral degeneration. Uh, So there's a kind of uh, physical presence of moral degeneration or physical evidence of that in the stories of Arthur. Uh, so famous instances of that would be the nick on Gawain's neck in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, or you know, there's a there's a uh, leprosy ravaged characters in uh, sort of Grail stories indicate sort of a, a kind of moral compromise. Um, I think you get that with Mark in the sense that. Over time, there's a kind of physical change in the way that he gives in to temptation such that I think when, when, you, when you get his description late in the story, we get this, we get Studdock's face appeared to him to have changed since they last met. It had grown fatter and paler and there was a new vulgarity in expression. So now certainly that's meant to illustrate, you know, stress and strain of working for nice. It's not a pleasant place to work, contrary to its name. Uh, and so he's indulging in, you know, uh, alcohol and, and tobacco to alleviate anxiety. But at the same time, I think we're supposed to read that uh, as narrative shorthand for moral deterioration. And that's exactly what you get in kind of, or, or similarly in, in Arthurian lit too. Um, so um, I think there's a, there's a kind of debt uh, to, uh, to the Arthurian tradition that Lewis has described. Okay, so let me, let me conclude... Um, 
uh, with a kind of suggestion of why I think Lewis is important to read uh, and his distinctive supernatural science fiction. So I, I, the sense that I get is that Lewis's scholarship enables him to inhabit a perspective that's distinctly um, separate uh, and apart from the, the modern world um, to the extent that even, he even calls himself um, a dinosaur, an example of the old Western man. So he, he gives a, an address when he takes up the chair in medieval and Renaissance lit at Cambridge and says, you know, like, I'm not a modern person. In some sense, I think he's indicating how his affections and inclinations and kind of default settings are of a previous era. And I think to some sense, in some sense, we can take him at his word when we read his fiction because it's somebody who, who's, and, and scholarship, who's lovingly invested uh, and compelled by this worldview, I think. And so it's that worldview, the, the kind of medieval and, and early Renaissance perspective that he works into the architecture of the space trilogy. And so, if you like, I, I simply put, I think his scholarship um, augmented his creative work, and so a lot of what you read are recast forms and characters and ideas taken from medieval and Renaissance and, and classical lit, too. Uh, and this, I think, enables him to be a keen critic of the present. So part of the pleasure, I think, of reading that hideous strength in the whole trilogy is uh, his ability to represent this contrast between the modern and the ancient worlds. And we get that, for instance, with Merlin talking about the strangeness of the 20th century. Uh, so it's, it's this, like this, um, this kind of grousing about like trying to make sense of it. Like there are these extraordinary comforts but the food is bland, there's a lack of pageantry, you know, uh, and it obviously challenges his categories. And conversely, uh, Merlin does the same to Dimble and company. And so Dimble says, uh, he says, it was so silly not to have realized that Merlin wouldn't know about forks. But what surprised me even more after the first shock was how, well, how elegant he was without them. I mean, you could see it wasn't a case of having no manners, but of having different ones. And so I think that last sentence in this, you know, small kind of throwaway moment from the, the novel is helpful for understanding, I think, Lewis's role as a literary critic and as a fiction writer because he, he doesn't practice or abide condescension for uh, the medievals from the moderns. And I think his, his conviction is actually theirs is a superior perspective uh, um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and this strikes me as especially valuable um, about Lewis's science fiction because to imbibe his fiction encourages a vantage point from which to critique contemporary culture and understand it by contrast, if you like. And then secondly, um, here, uh, and if I may, speaking as a, as a Christian, I think it affords uh, the imaginative experience of spiritual realities that are consonant with scripture. Uh, so looking back on my own reading life, my coming to Lewis's, Lewis's fiction and trilogy here was formative because um, he gives you these uncanny, wondrous, visceral um, kind of experiences, but they're in service of, of Christian theology. And so a uh, confession here, uh, as, a, as a kid, my, my interests uh, reading were two. One, I was interested in stories of, of bravery, adventures, etc., uh, but two, I love tales of the fantastic, the uncanny, the weird, uh, the mysterious. Um, and so occasionally I would get that in, you know, uh, detective stories, I guess, like the Hardy Boys or the Three uh, Investigators. But invariably the whiff of uh, Supernatural would be kind of like dissolved at the end when, like Scooby-Doo, you know, the bad guy would pull off his mask and it would be like a, a very human person with, you know, very human motivations, like the disgruntled employee or the neighbor. Um, uh, but reading, um, uh, as a kid, reading other works like the works of, say, Dean Koontz, um, that's where I got those pure moments of uncanny terror. Uh, so, you know, the strange, the alien, the foreign, you know, whether it's a genetically engineered predator that lives on malevolent violence or an ancient creature that's responsible for mass disappearances or extinctions or evil goblins dis disguised as humans who thrive on human suffering. Um, all of these things were terrifying, uh, but, you know, true renderings of the uncanny. Um, and I was addicted to these like, like I had a vitamin deficiency or something. 
Um, so these, these uh, moments of uncanny dread were the fodder of nightmares, um, you know, uh, chores that took place uh, on our farm after dark. Uh, suddenly the dark would be peopled with precisely these sorts of characters. Nevertheless, I was absolutely enthralled and couldn't stop reading them. And so I think when I came to Lewis, that was the delight is that I got such moments, um, but it was in service of a kind of ethical theological system uh, that was, you know, arguably more edifying. Um, and so I think that's the benefit, for me at least, uh, of Lewis's fiction in particular and of uh, a certain kind of Christian literature in general because imbibing, uh, you know, uh, or inhabiting a secular culture can mean that one's kind of understanding of the world is circumscribed, of reality is, is circumscribed. And so really good fiction like Lewis's is really enriched um, uh, by his learning uh, and his love for the medieval model and it can reorient one, reorient one's perspective. Uh, and speaking as one from the Reformed tradition, um, which insists on the primacy of special revelation, it complements scripture. So given the human tendency to, to become uh, uh, inured to the, and this speaking privately uh, or personally, inured to the gifts of God and the deceptiveness of the human heart, I think literature can uniquely dramatize uh, the, the truths of scripture. And, uh, and it has this dynamic operation that can catch one by surprise. So I've never had an encounter with an angel, but if I did, I suspect it would uh, resemble uh, uh, Ransom's interactions with the El, El Dilla. So uh, to quote uh, a, a wonderful uh, Nigerian uh, reform theologian, Hans Matawame at, at Covenant College, uh, he says, after spending time with Lewis, I'm reminded how urgently we need fiction writers aspiring to this kind of literature. So opening up worlds of beauty and wonder and spiritual reality, uh, there isn't much of this um, being written today with such quality, and that's a loss, tragic even, and I hope someone will pick up the pen and start imagining incredible things that can edify and even transform us. So I say amen to that. Um, and, and a, a final note, I, I think we tend to think of the Inklings primarily as, as authors, but they were also readers who recognized um, their delight in and need for tales about spiritual realities. Um, and I keep thinking about the importance of imbibing stories in our, in our own uh, kind of materialist uh, era because they appeal so powerfully uh, to our emotions and our imaginations. And so along these lines, I'll let Lewis have the, the last word. Um, he says in fairy stories in that collection of other worlds, he says, um, regarding the Chronicles of Narnia, but I think it applies to the Space Trilogy too, he says, I thought I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which had paralyzed much of my own religion and childhood. Why did one find it so hard to feel as one ought or as one was told one should feel about God or the sufferings of Christ? And for me, I think this clarifies the benefit of that hideous strength, um, as he puts it in the subtitle, a modern fairy tale for grown-ups and for uh, the rest of his science fiction trilogy. So, thank you. And I, um, David uh, suggested I could, I could field questions if y'all would be interested. Yeah, I think, so um, the book to read, I, I suppose, would be Michael Ward's uh, book on, is it the Narnia Code? Uh, or the Narnia Code? Okay, uh, and he's got an, an essay in Touchstone magazine that I think is available online. But he um, basically does this sort of program uh, with the Chronicles of Narnia and shows how 
uh, each book uh, is organized thematically and conceptually around uh, one of the medieval spheres. Uh, and so I think that's, uh, a, that would be a great example of um, evidence of Lewis doing there what I think he does here too. Uh, so in some sense, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to, to the brilliant and talented Michael Ward for sure. Um, but I think you, you, all you have to do is, is pick up, and, and maybe that was like one of the chief delights of graduate school was realizing that Lewis's scholarship was as delightful uh, and enriching as his fiction. But you pick it up uh, like his, his um, companion to 16th century uh, poetry and prose or the discarded image, etc., and you realize just how lovingly engaged and, and rich uh, um, his appreciation for this era and these works are. And I think it's just a, a, another a dramatization in the fiction. Yeah, so if that makes sense. I think, so I've probably made Arthurian Lit, no, not probably, I've made Arthurian Lit too tidy here, for sure. It is, is uh, there's a profusion of uh, different authors who have different and discrete purposes. Uh, so there's not always a kind of, as you put it, uh, messianic uh, Christian quality, um, uh, especially in the Romance tradition. Um, uh, but I think Lewis is committed to that one. And so he loves, I, I guess, picking up on the Fisher King as wounded by um, uh, the, the satanic figure corresponding to, to Genesis, um, in part because it, it's, it fits, it, it helps him sort of with the architecture of the story. Even, and I'd never thought of this before, but even Ransom's being transported back to Venus after that hideous strength, uh, and so he can uh, inhabit, you know, this, this realm and be kind of freed of his, um, this, this, this burden of pain, um, is like Avalon. Uh, so it's like he takes that, that Avalon precursor uh, and, and gives it his own rendering. But uh, it's primarily Lewis reading the uh, messianic strain because the Fisher King has different representations. It's not always uh, um, given a kind of um, stringently Christian uh, cast, uh, especially in the nature of the wound. It could be moral compromise, but sometimes it's, it's Percival's fault for not asking about his wound, and so it's the focus is on Percival's pursuit of the Grail. Uh, so it's 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 really richer and more complicated than I made it. But I think Lewis loves that that strain, uh, as if he sees them trying to get at what is for him the essential truth or, or story that culminates in in his story. 
I think it's way more, um, uh, you know, deeply allegorical. I, I think you're exactly right in the way that the first two are not. I mean, I tend to think of Out of the Silent Planet as uh, a kind of uh, 19th century riff. Um, um, and, 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 you know, thinking about Wells, I think Paralandra, he's rewriting uh, Paradise Lost, I think, uh, and giving an alternate version where Eve does not uh, fall. Uh, and then this last one, I think, is, is more medieval in its allegorical nature. I mean, I think one, one author I didn't mention, a Renaissance author, author um, is Edmund Spencer uh, and, and his fairy queen. There are moments here, especially at the end, um, where if you go for, if your disposition is realism, uh, it will just seem silly. Um, it's like you have to have an openness to the way that, uh, and, and apply the interpretive lens and criteria of, of an allegory, uh, where realism and even, uh, uh, yeah, verisimilitude in the way that uh, certain fiction, you know, dictates and suggests. Lewis, in that in that work that I recommended um, of Other Worlds, there's a great conversation that that he sort of confesses uh, frustration, I think, with um, uh, maybe Golding's Lord of the Flies. He says, like, he's too good, he says this, he's too good a writer for his own good. He notices things uh, that one would only notice if you have, a, like, a fever. Uh, so I think that, that gives away, uh, Lewis, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't go in for that kind of Jamesian uh, kind of realist description of the concourse of thoughts in the human mind and experiences and subjectivity. I think certainly, as you, as you as you suggest in that hideous strength, it's it's deeply uh, allegorical and, and resonant for um, uh, objective uh, descriptions of, of human experience, uh, not necessarily particularity, uh, a fierce particularity of Mark Studdock or Jane, et cetera. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think reading it alongside medieval works helps tease that element out of it. Tolkien, uh, I, it's funny to tour back through the scholarship. I think he found it equally, you know, frustrating and distasteful. And <laughs> so I, I think he was, I, I think he, he, he agreed. He couldn't make sense of it. Despite the fact that Lewis, I think, is at pains to honor his friend and, you know, uh, and, you know, lovingly, he sees it as a, as a tribute. I think Tolkien sees it as plagiarism. He takes ideas from Tolkien that show up in uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, so, yeah. David. I think that's exactly right too. Uh, that's that's one place that um, oh, sorry, one place among many places where I'm seriously deficient. Uh, I, I I have not read a lot of Williams, but um, I know he's taking um, you know he's he's borrowing lots of, of plot features for sure uh, from uh, from Williams. Uh, I, I think one, one scholar I read called jokes that this is a, a, a a Charles Williams spiritual fantasy written by C.S. Lewis. Um, and, you know, a lot of the criticism uh, or reviews, contemporary reviews, when it, when it comes out in uh, 45, I suppose, um, uh, are, uh, you know, criticize it for just that kind of property that you get in Williams, which is uh, uh, the combination of everyday kind of realities uh, and, and spiritual, uh, a spiritual component. And Lewis says in a letter to 
uh, Dorothy Sayers, um, it's, it's frustrating because these are the, precisely the kind of stories that I like, even to the point that he writes Williams a fan letter, um, and, and he says, point B, we have to put up with this combination in our own lives. And I think that's, that, that's kind of interesting, I think, for his recognition that, that we inhabit life with a spiritual component, and he wants fiction to render that, even if imperfectly, to get us to uh, experience it imaginatively and, and emotionally. I think his, his reference to Numenor and his promo uh, for for those who want a time travel story, they'll have to look to Tolkien. So it's it's more like the extra textual advertisement for Tolkien's story. So I, I think the and this is attested to by a number of uh, people who knew both. Um, I think the trilogy grows out of a conversation with Tolkien where they said, you know, there's a dearth of stories that we like. So we're going to have to write them ourselves. And so they both agree, commit themselves to, to writing fiction, and this grows out of that. Um, but I think we get a, and, and please help me if you're inclined, I think we get reference to Numenor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least out of the silent plan it is. That's a great question. I mean, I wanted to ask you all. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I would love to, I'm always on the lookout for, you know, a, a great book. So if y'all can think, or if you know of folks who are doing this, I, I guess science fiction. I, I have not. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, that's very helpful. I, I will say, uh, it comes to mind, the, I don't know if you all have seen uh, Stranger Things, the first season. But the, the upside down, uh, I appreciate, at least in the first season, the ambiguity that they give it. They don't necessarily explain it away in terms of physics and science, so it almost has a kind of allegorical spiritual um, uh, possibility. Um, now, it changes maybe in the second season, but um, I think that's a, that's a place where you know, my, my uncanny, mysterious uh, craving is, is being satisfied. I guess. <coughs> 